My name is Iran Segal. I'm at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Uh, happy to be here and tell you about, uh, about our work. So um, probably many of you know this, but uh, does this work? Wait a second. Ah, yeah, turning it on can help. Um, yeah, good. So uh, uh, probably many of you know this, but um, we're in the midst of a personalized medicine revolution, which is um, taking us from assigning the same therapy according to the condition to all patients, which only works for some patients, uh, to using personal data to ascribe the right treatment for each patient. And uh, so what do we need in order to uh, achieve effective personalized medicine? Well, we probably need many different measurements from uh, every person, as many as possible, uh, about diet, lifestyle, medications, uh, but then also molecular data, which is becoming available, like genetics, microbiome, metabolites. Uh, we'd like to have these on large patient cohorts, um, longitudinally. Uh, ideally an intervention so that we can infer causality and we want uh, uh, um, advanced analysis methods to be able to make sense of all of this data. Now until recently we mostly had randomized clinical trials on dozens of patients that didn't measure a lot of different uh, uh, information and although the ideal data set uh, that measures everything on millions of people, people is probably not realistic, in recent years, there's actually a lot of exciting data sets like uh, electronic health records that are becoming available that may measure traditional markers like uh, blood tests, diagnoses, medical background, uh, even up to millions of different people. Uh, then genetics, which is also now available on millions of people uh, in various countries now, cohorts of hundreds of thousands of individuals that measure uh, various uh, molecular markers then uh, medium-scale cohorts like ones that we did um, in our lab that uh, measure nearly all possible uh, markers. And there's a lot of advances in analysis methods for making sense of this data and also in methods that infer causality from uh, this observational data that eventually will lead to performing randomized clinical trials. So we work across uh, this entire space. The first project I want to tell you about is one that we did on gestational diabetes or uh, GDM. So uh, this is on uh, electronic health records, so in this uh, region of the space. Uh, GDM is a common complication of pregnancy in which uh, women without diabetes uh, become glucose uh, intolerant. Um, this pose poses medical threats, uh, both short-term and long-term, for mother uh, and offspring. Uh, but with lifestyle and dietary intervention, the risk can be, be reduced, and so um, early diagnosis can be very beneficial. But uh, despite its importance, there's actually not a lot of uh, tools that are available for uh, diagnosis today. And state of the art is to use the pamphlet that the NIH provided where you just sum up a list of known uh, risk factors. And so we wanted to ask whether we can do better than that using uh, EHR data. Now, the Israeli healthcare system is actually uh, very favorable for performing research because uh, it's nonprofit. Every citizen has to be a member of one of the four HMOs, and the HMO actually has fairly complete information about every patient because HMOs provide centralized services including uh, hospitalization, surgeries, medications, and chronic disease treatment. Uh, specifically, uh, we collaborate with uh, Klalit and analyze, which ensures uh, over half of Israel's uh, population, uh, 16 years of longitudinal data, and very little uh, patient turnover. And if we look at uh, an example of one uh, patient record, in this case fake data, but we can see uh, a height, blood pressure, diagnosis, lab tests, and medication measurements across a timeline for, uh, for every patient. And so uh, in GDM, GDM is diagnosed uh, by a glucose, the value of a glucose tolerance test between week 24 and 28 of gestation. Uh, and um, the reason we chose to work on GDM, aside from its medical relevance, is that every woman actually has to undergo this test uh, during this time period, which makes GDM a very unique problem to work on from EHR data because it will not suffer from uh, many of the biases that are inherent to EHR data, which typically has a lot more measurements on sick people. So uh, because GDM is diagnosed between weeks 24 and 28, we asked whether we can actually predict it earlier. Uh, we started in the data with uh, close to 1 million uh, births, 
uh, after filtering, we ended up with close to 600 thousand uh, pregnancies which we divided into a historic training set and a future test set to mimic a real-life uh, situation of deployment of a system uh, and this is by far the largest data that was ever analyzed for this problem and overall we had over 200 million uh, blood tests uh, in this uh, in this data so from this data we extracted over 2,000 features for uh, every patient from her medical history and from the current uh, pregnancy data. And then we use gradient boosting decision trees to predict GDM and derive a GDM risk score. So uh, this model actually performed uh, very well, achieving an area under the uh, uh, ROC curve of 0 0.86, much better than a baseline predictor. But on a more practical level, if we look at the precision recall graph, we can see that while the prevalence of GDM in our data is about 4%, if we look at the top 10% of uh, women identified as high risk by our predictor, there the prevalence is over 50%, making it very attractive for performing interventions. And if we look across uh, deciles, the model between the highest and lowest uh, deciles identifies a increase in uh, risk of GDM of close to 300-fold. The model also works uh, quite well on different subpopulations, uh, in particular on women who uh, previously gave birth, and also on women that today, according to known risk factors, are identified as uh, having high risk. The model can very well distinguish between those who will eventually develop uh, GDM and those uh, who will not. So uh, we next wanted to understand which features are actually driving the model predictions. And so for that, we used a feature attribution framework called uh, SHAP, which is very nice. It's, uh, it originated in uh, game theory. And I don't have time to go into explaining the full details of it. But uh, the basic idea is that it evaluates the contribution to the prediction of each feature when considering adding it to the model from all possible subsets of all other features and in all possible other orderings. So while this uh, sounds complex, actually for trees, this computation can be done uh, very efficiently. And so uh, using this analysis, we can then look at different categories of the 2,000 features that we have in the model and see which are contributing most to the model predictions. And at the top, are features that originate from uh, the history, from previous uh, uh, pregnancy. And in particular, the value of the glucose tolerance test in the previous pregnancy provides a very high increase in uh, the relative risk. Uh, followed uh, after that, we have various lab tests coming from the actual current pregnancy, like uh, the fasting glucose, then some uh, other measures from the medical history, like the hemoglobin A1C uh, of the patient, uh, then the number of relatives that uh, the woman has uh, with diabetes, and uh, the BMI uh, before uh, pregnancy. So this provides a lot of insights into features that actually drive uh, the model predictions. But uh, when we looked at these features, we saw that actually a lot of them actually are available to us even before gestation. And so we then uh, asked, how early can we actually predict uh, GDM? And very nicely, we saw that the predictions even before gestation were nearly as good as the predictions that we obtained after adding information from the pregnancy itself. So, so this is very nice. Uh, and then finally, we asked whether we can reduce the 2,000 features that we have to, uh, to a much smaller set. So again, we looked at the feature attribution framework, and we found that actually we can identify a small set of features that are very important in the model, and from that derive a very simple questionnaire, a very simple set of questions that every woman can actually answer about herself, even in a simple app. And then uh, we wanted to use these predictions and see how well they work uh, in a model. So these are just uh, you know age, weight, height, uh, relatives with diabetes, previous GDT and uh, a GTT in previous pregnancy, and then uh, some previous uh, diagnoses. And we saw that a model just based on this uh, very simple questionnaire actually achieves uh, not as good but, but very high quality predictions. And uh, when we look um, at the high risk uh, women, also can identify and prioritize women for um, effective intervention. And also its deciles have uh, and identify a much, uh, a very large increase in the overall risk. So uh, just summarizing this part, I showed you the, as far as we know, the first predictor of uh, GDM uh, based on electronical health records. 
uh, that actually works uh, with very high accuracy. Predictions uh, are possible based just on a simple questionnaire that every woman uh, can answer, and the model also identifies previously unknown um, factors. So we believe that uh, this model can actually be deployed and used to prioritize high-risk women for interventions even before gestation. And I didn't talk about this, but the model also identifies very well women with very low risk, so it can actually be used to also reduce the amount of tests and, and be used to avoid the GTT itself for about half of uh, the population uh, during screening. Okay, so uh, I want to move to a different project that, uh, that we did, which is on uh, trying to predict uh, childhood obesity. Uh, this is also a project that we did on uh, EHR data. Uh, childhood obesity, obesity is a major problem. Uh, it affects uh, actually one in three children is either overweight or obese, and, and there's many medical complications uh, that can arise from that. And here too, interventions can be effective, so there's, uh, there's value in uh, early diagnosis. So the first question that we asked in this problem is at what age should we try and predict uh, ob uh, childhood obesity? So uh, we turned to the Clalit data and we saw when uh, weights, uh, when measurements of weight are actually taken and we saw various peaks in the data. These correspond to routine checkups that uh, the Clalit does. And so looking at this data, one can consider that it would uh, probably be best to try and predict obesity at age five from all the data accumulated up to the age of two or at age 13 from all the data accumulated up to the age of five. And so when we uh, examined that, we saw that about 40% of kids who were obese at the age of 13 were already obese at age five, while only 27% of those who were obese at age five were obese at age two. So in other words, if you're obese at age five, you're quite likely to remain that uh, way at the age of 13, while at age two, there's still a lot more chance of uh, changing. Uh, and indeed, if we look at uh, kids who are obese at age 13, we can see that the most rapid changes in their weight occurs between the years two uh, and six of age. And when we look at kids who are obese at the age of five, we see that actually more than half of them were at normal weight uh, at the age of two. And so given all that, we decided to focus on trying to predict obesity at the age of five from all the data accumulated up to uh, the age of two. So uh, in this case, uh, we had close to one and a half million uh, kids uh, in the data. And after very stringent filtering that ensured that we only examine kids where we have routine checkups from both uh, the age of two and the age of five, we ended up with over 100,000 uh, kids, which again we divided into a historic training set and uh, a future uh, test set. So uh, here, uh, turning into the data, we extracted from the data over 900 different features. A lot of them come from features of the kit itself, uh, weight, uh, medications, lab tests, and so on, but then many other features coming from the family, from the parents uh, and the siblings. And again, we used uh, gradient boosting decision trees to predict obesity and arrive at a uh, obesity risk score. So here too, uh, the model performed uh, very well on a rock curve, significantly better than just using the last weight of the kid at the age of two, although in this case, the last weight of the kid also uh, performed uh, quite well. Um, uh, here too, uh, the model can actually also uh, identify the high-risk uh, kids uh, uh, very effectively, and overall the model uh, along its deciles identifies an over 50-fold increase uh, in the risk between the high and uh, lowest deciles. So here too we wanted to examine uh, the model's predictions and, and see which features are uh, driving the predictions. Um, uh, as may be expected, features that come from the child itself, and in particular the last weight of the child at the age of two uh, is, is, are the most uh, uh, predictive, most contributing features, incurring a very high relative risk for kids who are already uh, overweight uh, at the age of two. But then in second place come uh, many features that uh, uh, we can identify in the siblings. Uh, in fact, these features contrib contribute even more than the features of either the father or the mother. Uh, after that, we have some uh, features coming from the mother itself. In fact, the glucose tolerance test that we talked about before during uh, pregnancy um, is also, also confers uh, some risk. Uh, and then um, 
uh, quite surprisingly, although this has been discussed in the literature, various medications, and in particular antibiotic uh, usage, uh, doesn't really uh, confer any uh, risk factor, in, uh, at least in our data. So uh, then finally, we wanted to ask how early we can uh, actually predict uh, childhood obesity. And so uh, we, um, and, and so we, we, comp we evaluated the model predictions at different uh, stages. And, and what was uh, very interesting is that we saw that the model predictions, even before birth, so without knowing any information about the child, were as good as the model predictions when we take uh, um, just the, uh, the weight of the kid at the age of one. So, um, so this also means that uh, we can actually also identify kids uh, that are at high risk just using, ad, uh, using sibling and uh, parent information. So uh, just uh, summarizing this part, I showed you that uh, the most rapid changes in obesity occur between the age of two and six, and that using EHR data we can uh, accurately predict uh, childhood obesity during this time period and identify various risk factors such as family features that show interesting associations and that can be used to prioritize interventions for uh, infants who are at high risk. So uh, finally, um, in the last uh, few minutes uh, uh, that I have, um, I want to turn to uh, a different project that we did this time on looking at metabolites that circulate in our bloodstream, which obviously are very critical uh, for our health. Uh, this is a project that we did on a medium-sized cohort that we collected in the lab on 1,000 uh, participants. Um, and the basic question that we asked is, uh, what determines levels of different metabolites, molecules that circulate uh, in our bloodstream? Obviously a very important question uh, for our health. So uh, we used the cohort that we collected from um, a project that we had called the Personalized Nutrition Project. Uh, uh, this project collected information on uh, 1,000 participants, uh, a lot of dietary information connecting them to continuous glucose monitors and measuring uh, not all but many different uh, molecular markers. And in particular, uh, it measured metabolites in the serum based on uh, mass spectrometry uh, measurements. So uh, these measurements actually measure over 1,200 different metabolites. One of these metabolites is uh, cholesterol. Um, uh, a lot of these metabolites are very common metabolites. So over 1,100 of them are detected in over 50% of uh, all the patients. Um, they actually span a wide range of different types of metabolites, many lipids, amino acids, uh, xenobiotic, nucle nucleotides, uh, and, and so on. And the very basic question that we asked is what determines levels of metabolites and we thought that the most stringent way to demonstrate that would be uh, if we could actually predict levels of metabolites using all the other input features uh, that we have. So uh, the way this would work is, for example, if we wanted to predict levels of caffeine that we measure in the blood using dietary data, we would take uh, a, a data matrix that has dietary information on many patients. We would take the caffeine levels as measured by the mass spec by the metabolite data and then use some algorithm to predict metabolite levels and then evaluate a subject whose uh, 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 caffeine levels we never observed and uh, test the predictions on that and compare it to the actual measurement. So in the case of caffeine, this, actually, uh, uh, this predictor can actually work uh, very well and, and its predictions match uh, very well the actual observed data. But of course, caffeine is just one metabolite and so we'd like to try and predict all different 1,200 metabolites from many different types of features that we have, including uh, gut microbiome data, um, diet, and, and many other uh, different parameters. And so overall, we developed uh, 13, over 13,000 different predictors to predict each of these different metabolites from each of the different uh, feature groups. And, and as I mentioned, caffeine is just one of these examples. So uh, the first question was then, how many of these metabolites could we actually predict? And we found that over 90% of these 1,200 metabolites that we can measure in the blood could be significantly predicted by at least one of these different uh, input feature groups. The most predictive group of features was a uh, diet. So what people eat can predict a lot of the metabolites in their bloodstream. But then in second place, um, the gut microbiome information could uh, actually predict um, a lot of metabolites as well. Um, I'll skip uh, this slide. Uh, and again, we use the uh, uh, SHAP, uh, I 
think we started late, uh, so we have a few more minutes. Yeah, right. Okay. So, um, so using again the SHAP analysis, we could identify which particular features uh, in the diet actually uh, can provide these predictions to metabolites, um, uh, and that gives a lot of insights into features that may actually drive uh, these predictions. So in the case of the caffeine predictions that I showed you before, perhaps as expected, we see that self-reporting drinking of coffee is the most predictive feature of um, levels of caffeine in the blood. So you can see that when we color code uh, uh, coffee drinkers, uh, they have the highest level of caffeine uh, in the blood. Another uh, other nice positive uh, control example, so uh, stachadrine, this is a a product of citrus fruit, and uh, when we examine the SHAP analysis, the feature attribution, we see that uh, people who reported um, uh, eating oranges have, uh, this is the most uh, predictive feature, and indeed they have uh, higher levels of this, of this compound. Uh, then another f um, compound that we could predict it well is a metabolite that's found in many fish products, and indeed people who report eating fish also have elevated levels of this metabolite uh, in their bloodstream. So, so this is for um, this is for diet. We also looked at the feature attribution in the case of gut bacteria, and uh, here too we could look at uh, different metabolites that are predicted very well by gut microbiome information, and color code that by the actual levels of bacteria that were the most predictive, and identify bacteria that most likely are those who are maybe producing and maybe driving and are responsible for the levels of these metabolites in our bloodstream. Now the reason that uh, this is important is because if we have metabolites that from other sources we know are metabolites that can cause disease, then now we've identified bacteria that may modulate the levels of these molecules in our bloodstream, so that may give us a path to how we can actually um, uh, uh, how we can actually uh, start to derive therapeutics based on gut bacteria by modulating levels of uh, different bacteria in the blood. So, uh, uh, so, so, uh, so a lot of these associations are interesting and in one proof of concept uh, experiment we also showed that some of them may also not just be associative but also uh, causal. So we did a uh, intervention study in which we gave people to eat uh, bread for one week and we saw that indeed metabolites that according to our cross-sectional analysis should be elevated after consumption of whole wheat bread indeed increased after whole wheat bread consumption but not after white bread uh, consumption so that's just a proof of concept that um, some of these associations may be causal and may be giving us a way into how we may be able to uh, perform interventions either by gut bacteria or by diet whose purpose now is to modulate different metabolites uh, in our bloodstream. So uh, with that I'll just end and just tell you about a uh, new project that we've recently launched. We call it the 10K project uh, where the goal is to uh, recruit 10,000 participants now and obtain now a very full and comprehensive uh, data set of molecular phenotypes and try and predict uh, disease uh, years before uh, it actually occurs. So with that I'll put uh, just the acknowledgement slide and thank the uh, many students uh, in my group uh, that were responsible for uh, driving uh, uh, all these models. So Nitsan Chagain Smodar for all the work on the EHR data, Noam and Tal for the work on the metabolite data. The work on the EHR data is in collaboration with Rana Dar Shiri Chazan and Arnon Vishnitzer from uh, Rabin Medical Center and the work on Khalid is in collaboration with Ran Balitza and with that I'll end and be happy to take any questions. Thank you.